Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, November 21st, 2016. Here are our top stories. Tonight, war breaks out between the neocons and libertarians over President-elect Donald Trump's foreign policy as the military-industrial complex attempts to regain control of the White House. Meanwhile, Senators Lindsey Graham and Songbird McCain say they will not cooperate with Donald Trump's efforts to improve relations with Russia. Then, why are you so interested in Seth Rich's killer? We're very interested in anything that might be a threat to alleged WikiLeaks sources. The mysterious unsolved murder of DNC staffer Seth Rich. And they are now offering a $100,000 reward for any information that leads to the arrest of the killers. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Well, the good news is that Trump has skin in the game. And the good news is that the federal employees who've worked on a position of privilege are afraid that they're going to be losing that privilege that has kept them employed as the rest of the country goes unemployed. Now, over the weekend, of course, we had Trump settle the $25 million lawsuit regarding Trump University. We talked about this earlier today. I said, you know, it's very tells you everything you need to know about this, that the media completely ignored the much larger scandal of the Clintons with Laurent University. There were questions there about the efficacy of the degrees, but there were also issues of influence peddling, money laundering, the same sort of thing that you always see from the Clinton Foundation. But I think it's important to look at the fact that Donald Trump has paid $25 million to set this aside so that he can move on with the business of government. Now, it's not uncommon to see someone who is wealthy putting their own money in. And of course, $25 million is a lot of money even to a billionaire like Donald Trump. It's not uncommon to see them do that in order to become president. But now that he's won the election, he has decided that he's going to put this in to help him to set up a governing coalition. I think that's a very positive sign. He pointed out the only bad thing about winning the presidency is I didn't have time to go through a long but winning trial on Trump University. Too bad. In other words, he believes that he could have won. And, of course, he could have won. He could have negotiated down this settlement. Instead, he just said, here, take it all. I've got to get busy running the country. I think that's a very good a sign of what's to come. But also, it's a very good sign that the federal bureaucracy is very worried about the fact that they're going to lose some of their privileges. This story from the Washington Post, the hand-wringing that we see from the federal bureaucracy saying that uh, Trump and the Republican-controlled Congress is drawing up plans to take on the government bureaucracy that is long, they've long railed against by eroding their special job protections, grinding down benefits that federal workers have received for a generation. Perhaps those benefits are out of line with the benefits that are received by the people who pay their salaries and the rest of the country. Things like uh, they're looking at hiring freezes because they've been growing uncontrollably. And then to automatic raises that they also get. A green light to fire poor performers. Why would they be exempted from that? Why would they get automatic uh, raises? Why would they not have performance reviews where they could not be fired? See, that's an outrage. That is something that should be addressed, and only an outsider like Trump uh, do we have a, po a, a possibility of that even happening. And again, as we pointed out earlier today, the number of government employees now surpasses manufacturing jobs by 10 million. I pointed this out last week on the Nightly News, and the fact that the increase in the number of federal jobs was more than twice what the decrease in manufacturing jobs were. So isn't that amazing that we see that kind of growth that cannot be sustained. That has to stop. And yet we see that the establishment is now beginning to push back. And we can see this no better than with Henry Kissinger. Uh, let's take a look at what Henry Kissinger said as we had a president-elect Obama eight years ago. And now that we have a president-elect Trump. Now remember, eight years ago, uh, as he had just won back in January of 2009. We have a story here from Infowars.com. Kissinger was lauding the coming depression, saying it was a tool that could be used. He said it generates a unique opportunity to usher in a world financial order and to force sovereign nations to, quote, face the reality that its dilemmas can be mastered only by common action. How did we see this manifest? Well, we saw that in Europe in the last eight years, uh, precisely by the fact that they created an economic catastrophe. Then they said, well, it's going to take... You surrendering your sovereignty to the European Union in order for us to make this work. 
that's what they tried to do here as well. He goes on to say it eight years ago, this is Henry Kissinger, an international order will emerge if a system of compatible priorities comes into being. Okay. Then he says the extraordinary uh, impact of the president-elect Obama on the imagination of humanity is an important element in shaping a new world order. He goes on to say the most powerful clique in these elitist groups have one objective in common. Now, of course, Kissinger is on the board of all these globalist organizations, Council on Foreign Relations, a trilateral commission, which was created by his successor who ran the Carter administration. Big New Brzezinski uh, was the one who created the trilateral commission. We can see that mirrored in the trade partnerships, the Trans-Pacific, the Transatlantic partnerships with us in the center. That's a picture of the trilateral commission. And, of course, the Bilderberg Group, the Davos Group. We see all these different groups that are meeting. One of the former members of the CFR, Rear Admiral Chester Ward at the time, said the most powerful clique in these elitist groups have one objective in common. They want to bring about the surrender of the sovereignty of the national independence of the United States. And that's what we saw this last election on. One more quote from eight years ago. And of course, this was also in January of 2009. He had a CNBC interview. This was reported by New American. Uh, they asked him, what do you think, Mr. Kissinger, is the most important thing for President-elect Barack Obama? And he said, the President-elect is coming into office at a moment when there are upheavals in many parts of the world simultaneously. They talked about what's going on in catastrophes in India and Pakistan, the jihadist movement, exactly. But then listen to what he has to say. He says, but Obama can give new impetus to American foreign policy. I think his task will be to develop an overall strategy for America in this period when really a new world order can be created. It's a great opportunity. It isn't such a crisis because they always use crisis as an opportunity to further their agenda, the new world order. What is he saying now that we have a president elect Trump eight years later? Well, he's talking about perhaps he has the opportunity to mold Trump. He doesn't control Trump yet, and we hope that doesn't happen. And of course, the way they exerted control on the Reagan administration was to put more than 300 CFR members in the State Department. So it's very important at this point in time that people like Senator Sessions, who know what the game is about, hold fast and have some say in this. And so we hope that that is the case. But, of course, uh, Kissinger points out when he's interviewed, he says Trump doesn't have any obligations to any group. He's not owned by anybody. He got into power, he says, with absolutely no baggage. He says the most unique a uh, situation for this president-elect that I have experienced in that respect. He says he has no obligations to any particular group because he has become president on the basis of his own strategy. In other words, he doesn't owe these guys anything, and he's not owned by them. But then he goes on with kind of a warning. He says, one should not insist on nailing him into positions that he hasn't taken in the campaign, of which he doesn't insist. He said that in reaction to the interviewer saying, yeah, but what about all these things where he's going to rearrange the uh, globalist trade agreements and so forth? And he goes, well, I'm not going to insist him in this. You know, perhaps he will change. And we always criticize people before they come in. But if he insists on coming into that, he says, if he insists on them, then, of course, disagreements would become expressed. In other words, they'll take that. Uh, they're going to see. If he's really going to do what he has to say, if he does, then they're going to be fighting him. See, he's not excited like he was eight years ago about the potential of creating a new world order out of the, out of the crisis that they viewed as an opportunity. And at the same time, we see a war breaking out between neocons and libertarians. This is an article on Infowars.com today from Zero Hedge. Say a battle is brewing between GOP foreign policy establishment and outsiders over who will sit on President-elect Trump's national security team. And they point out that, of course, we had a very conventional and hawkish Hillary Clinton that the establishment was looking forward to. They thought she was going to win. Republicans and Democrats who make up the foreign policy elite are laying the groundwork for a more assertive American foreign policy via Flurry reports. Uh, this was back when the Washington Post was so uh, confident that Hillary Clinton was going to win. That's what they were writing. But now they point out that there's a fight emerging. As a matter of fact, we see some very positive signs in that side as well. A person who has pushed for uh, Bolton, who I think would be a, a very, <laughs> quite a disaster. We've talked about this a, a lot at InfoWars. The guy who is a full-on neocon, we see uh, Elliot Cohen, who is also a former Bush State Department senior advisor, uh, said that, you know, Col Bolton would be capable Secretary of State. He'd be experienced and tough. He said, uh, however, he said, based on what I've seen, 
I think that um, this Trump transition team, we just need to stay away from them. And in other reports that we have seen, he said, they came in and they said, we won, you lost, now you're trying to insinuate your way into this administration. So there is an understanding within the Trump transition team of who these people are and the fact that they are pushing for war at a number of different levels. There are some good signs. We have seen uh, General Flynn put in, who wants to see a detente between America and Russia. And we have retired Ar Army Colonel Andrew Basevich saying that there needs to be a rethinking of American foreign policy. He said the U.S. must consider whether Saudi Arabia and Pakistan qualify as U.S. allies. He said the establishment doesn't want to touch questions like these with a 10-foot pole. Absolutely true. Now, at the same time, we've got the usual suspects, people like Lindsey Graham, John McCain, who are vowing to fight Trump's efforts to improve Russian ties. Yeah, they won a war, and they're going to do everything they can uh, to make that war happen. Trump has earned considerable scorn from NATO member nations for promising a normalization of U.S.-Russian relations. Now it looks as though there is a bipartisan collection of senators stepping forward, promising to rein in any efforts of Trump to improve Russian relations. And, of course, on that would be Lindsey Graham, who's vowed to go after Russia over allegations they've been interfering with our election process. So there he is, and we also have John McCain saying uh, that they attempted to undermine America's elections. That same red herring that was put out by the DNC is now being put forward by the warmongers, Lindsey Graham and John McCain. That's the, the only basis that they have for opposing them, uh, saying that we have to understand that Russia is and always will be an adversary and not a partner. That we don't have to go to war. We even have the commander of NATO, uh, the Navy commander, saying Russia is not our enemy. That's a good sign. Navy Commander Vice Admiral Clive Johnstone said at a NATO parliamentary assembly, and of course he is the uh, commander, uh, top commanding officer in NATO. He says Russia, NATO does not see Russia as its enemy, but is trying to understand Moscow's motives and protect its own interests at the same time. He said Russia can develop and deploy its fleet to any areas, but NATO does not intend to stop it. Russia is not our enemy. We have no desire to get involved in a new Cold War. Good. But then he goes on to say, however, the vice admiral went on to accuse Russia of escalating tensions instead of controlling the situation, even going so far as to say that Russia is apparently trying to create a new world order. Now, that is not true. The new world order is coming from the people like Henry Kissinger. A good example of where we don't want to go, and it's, it's very concerning to see Donald Trump even talking to some people like John Bolton. I don't know, again, if it is the old adage, keep your friends close, put your enemies closer. Uh, I hope that he doesn't go anywhere close to this guy. Here's three reasons, according to Business Insider, that John Bolton is a dangerous pick for Secretary of State. Now, of course, uh, Donald Trump has said, I'm the only one who knows what the finalists are. But number one, Bolton refuses to learn anything from the interventionist mistakes. Okay, now he's calling for an Iran regime change. And as I point out in this article, we spent $2 trillion, thousands of lives, and we don't even have a stable Iraq. That was Donald Trump saying that. Now we've got John Bolton, author of these types of policies, coming in and saying just last year he thinks that toppling Saddam Hussein was the right choice. He didn't learn anything from it. Number two, John Bolton's approach is always war first, not America first. The type of thing that we saw during the debates when only Rand Paul and Donald Trump would say, uh, I don't think we need to push for a no-fly zone in Syria because pushing for that would be pushing for war. And the third thing, Bolton blames every problem on restraint. As I point out to here, Bolton tell it. Every foreign policy problem can be solved by hasty, expensive, reckless action. Throw enough money, weapons, and American lives at it, and you can fix anything, he believes. Thus, we see Bolton recommending U.S. military invention everywhere and anywhere, bizarrely suggesting that the intervention wrought turmoil in Libya, Yemen, Iraq, and beyond are somehow the result of an action. And, of course, we've been telling you for the last several years that what is going on in Syria was fomented and created by the United States government using ISIS as a surrogate, just as they did in Libya, creating chaos there with their regime change. We pointed out that the narratives that the sarin gas was shot uh, by the Syrian government against people, that was false. Eventually, U.S. intelligence admitted that as well. Honest people uh, there joined with people at the U.N., people uh, with Russia and with Syria saying, no, that wasn't from them. That was from a different source. So we've seen them pushing, even with false flag events, to try to get this war going. But 
Of course, people like John Bolton thinks that it was just an action that caused this. And they go on to say, one thing is clear. Cozying up to Bolton and his ilk is a dangerous step away from Trump's better impulses and towards repetition of the very mistakes of the last 15 years that Trump's supporters trust him to repudiate. Now, when we come back, we're going to talk about the uh, surveillance state and how it's still going strong. But I think it's important to look at the tactics of the left, how they've pushed back. Remember uh, when Jeff Sessions was announced, we've seen this massive push again, calling him a racist, just like we see them calling Steve Bannon a racist. Uh, it's not working because it's not true. Uh, and, of course, as we see Anna Navarra uh, call him out on um, uh, CNN for being a racist, she says, you know, there were these things that came up. They were allegations, actually, uh, 20, 30 years ago that kept him from getting a judge appointment, they said at the time. Uh, of course, those are never vetted. We don't know if they were true. But she says there's no statute of limitations on racism, except, of course, if you're talking about somebody like Senator Robert Byrd, who was uh, somebody who created chapters of the Ku Klux Klan, who was an exalted cyclops, who was heavily involved in that. And the Democrats had absolutely no problem forgiving him for his real racism when they come out with something that even if it were true, if it is true, these allegations that uh, have not been proven against uh, uh, Jeff Sessions, even if they were true, they are far more minor than what the genuine Ku Klux Klan guy Robert Byrd did. But the real issue that we're going to talk about when we come back, and it is something that is a concern with Jeff Sessions, it is something that is a concern with Donald Trump, and that is the surveillance state. Certainly, it's not going to be any worse than it would have been with Hillary Clinton. But will we be able to convince people like Senator Sessions that liberty is more important than security, that the Constitution and the rule of law is more important than security? We shall see, and we'll look at the uh, questions about that when we return. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. As I pointed out in the last segment, there's a lot of opposition by the establishment against Jeff Sessions. Accusing him of being a racist, as they did Donald Trump, as they continue to do Steve Bannon. But, of course, he's not a racist. They call him a racist because they say he's a hardliner on immigration. In other words, he thinks we ought to have borders. He thinks we ought to have a legal system. So that makes him a racist. You know, I have the most respect for Jeff Sessions. As I've pointed out many times, he was the only senator to look at these trade treaties that were written by multinational corporations to point out the many flaws in them to point out that they were going to allow an international commission that didn't answer to us any more than the people who wrote this trade agreement and said the senators and congressmen couldn't look at it until they were done. Those people were going to be deciding which countries, which industries are going to prosper and which ones were going to fail. And as he also pointed out, it was going to be a living document. He's an originalist. He believes that what the Constitution of the law says, it really means. Not that we can just interpret that with the judicial system to mean whatever we wish it to mean. And, of course, that would have been the way the International Commission operated. And, of course, uh, he has uh, informed Donald Trump. He was the first one to endorse Donald Trump. He's never endorsed anybody other than Trump in the past. And he has essentially, I think, been a, a good educator, a good mentor for Donald Trump on these issues. However, that doesn't mean that I agree with everything that he has to say. I believe that we do have a chance to change his mind on the issues that we disagree with him on. And I think it's something that we need to look at. This article from Wired Magazines, for example, as they focus on racism, which is not the issue, this is a real issue with Jeff Sessions. His nomination as attorney general alarms civil libertarians. Now, understand that when they say he's an advocate for surveillance and an enemy of encryption, so is Obama. So would have Hillary Clinton been. So we're not losing ground with Jeff Sessions on this issue. We're just staying and continuing down this path that we have seen happening before. There is a chance that we might be able to change his mind and to change Donald Trump's mind on this uh, because he's not owned by the CIA, like uh, Barack Obama was. But as they point out in this article, he's long stood to the right, even among his conservative Republican colleagues, as a champion of security above all else. No, it should be liberty above all else. And that, I think, is really the difference between conservatives and libertarians. So this is a debate that we can have. It is a debate that we should have. We should not set aside and just say, all right, it's enough that you oppose a new world order, but we don't have to do anything to move the cause of individual liberty ahead. We can continue to go down this path of a police state. No, I don't want to do that. So when it comes to privacy, 
they say that uh, the senator has repeatedly worked to block NSA's privacy reforms. He's sided with the FBI in a standoff with Apple over the iPhone's encryption. He's pushed legislation that would force technology companies to turn over private information to law enforcement like CISPA and CISA, which just uh, went through. But understand, as I pointed out before, this is really coming from Obama. This isn't something that is a Trump issue. This isn't something that is a Sessions issue. And this is a bipartisan problem that we need to have a bipartisan solution to. And we can oppose this. But let's look at this article here from Free Thought Project. Three sinister things that Obama let, that America let Obama get away with that Trump can use to devastate the U.S. See, now those on the left are saying, well, now civil, civil liberties matter to us. It didn't matter to them when Barack Obama was doing this. And it wouldn't have mattered to them when Hillary Clinton was doing it. And what are these things? Well, number one, targeting Americans for extrajudicial assassination, even children. Remember that? The drone strikes against people who had not been found uh, guilty, people who were American citizens. Yeah, that's a very troubling precedent that was started. Number two, listen to and spy on anyone they want without warrant or justification. Number three, prosecute anyone who tells the truth. Come after Snowden. Maybe even come after Julian Assange. That's what Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama wanted to do. And remember, when we say these are three things that America let Obama get away with, uh, that Trump could continue on with, understand that Barack Obama put more people in prison who were journalists and whistleblowers under the 1917 Espionage Act than all the presidents between 1917 and Barack Obama combined. And that's what we're looking at here. Now, along that line, there is no good news with the Trump administration because he has appointed as uh, head of the um, uh, CIA a man named Pompeo. He's considered to be a serious hawkish member of the Republican National Security Establishment, says The Hill. And, of course, he has said, like Donald Trump, that Ed Snowden should be executed. No, whistleblowers should not be executed and especially not if you're not going to execute or imprison the people who violated the law, people like James Clapper, who is going to be allowed to retire. And when we look at another Wired uh, article where they were just gushing over James Clapper, it is absolutely amazing that they would have a problem with Jeff Sessions. That is the dual standard that we have to push against. The standard needs to be the Constitution and liberty, not whether they're a Republican or a Democrat. And yet that is the standard we see in the mainstream press. That is a standard we see in Wired. So they gush over this guy who, as you remember, he was asked the question by Ron Wyden. He looked down, he rubbed his eyes, and of course the body language said it all, that he was lying. And he said, no, we're not really looking at everybody's information. And then Ed Snowden said, yes, you are. Now, of course, our enemies know that. Other nation states know that. ISIS knows that. The only people who didn't know that were the American people that you were treating like criminals. And there's this long article on Wired Magazine, talking about the long career of James Clapper, because, you know, he came into this business, as they say, back in the early 1970s. James Clapper was a young military assistant to the director of the NSA when the entire U.S. intelligence establishment was thrown into upheaval. And what was that? That was the Pike and the uh, Church Committee hearings, where they found out at the time that the CIA and the NSA were, guess what, spying on the American people illegally. That was the essence of the Church and Pike Committee hearings. Not simply that they were assassinating people illegally, but that they were spying on the American people. And that was what caused us to create the FISA Act. And now they have used the FISA Act, just like they use their lying oaths to the Constitution. These things that were meant to constrain them, they have used as devices to spy on all of us. And so this is a man, James Clapper, who lied to the American people, who came in as uh, we were learning that they were spying on people. And now 40 years later, they say Clapper now presides over a broader intelligence purview than any of his bosses did back in the 1970s. So it has continued to grow. This has been a bipartisan situation. It has been Republicans and Democrats. It's gone on for decades. And we're going to have to turn this back at some point. We, we can't turn it back if we don't have a country. That's why we supported uh, Donald Trump, why I supported Donald Trump. Now, to give you an idea of the fact that this is not going anywhere, and this is still under the Obama administration, remember, we haven't had a uh, Trump administration, we see this report from WND, feds seek help spying on news articles, blogs, and posts. See, they're releasing even more new software, continually upgrade their game.
And at the same time, the IRS declaring war on Bitcoin privacy. Uh, from Fee.org, they say the IRS has filed a John Doe summons seeking to require a Bitcoin exchange called Coinbase to turn over records about every transaction on every user from 2013 to 2015. The demand is shocking, they say, in its sweep. It includes, quote, complete user profile, history of changes to user profile from account inception, complete user preferences, complete user security settings and history, including confirmed devices and account activity, complete user payment methods, and any other information related to the funding sources for the account, wallet, vault, regardless of date. Think about that. See, that is the way our government operates at every level. That is what we essentially have with the FISA Act, where they go in, as I said, it was set up to constrain them from illegally spying on American citizens. Instead, they said, you can go into this so-called court, which is not a court, it's simply a single judge, and you can go in, as Rand Paul pointed out, and say, I want a search warrant for Mr. and Mrs. Verizon, and you get everybody's information records. But look at how thorough this is, and look at how the IRS is doing this. It's every government agency believes that they can operate like an illegal black government CIA NSA uh, site. And, of course, here you have the situation where the IRS goes in and says, I want Mr. and Mrs. John Doe's records. What is the basis for this sweeping confiscation of our records. Well, they say uh, it's not limited to owners of large amounts of Bitcoin or those who have transacted in large amounts. No, they want everything from everybody. And here's the basis for their demand. One IRS agent recounts having learned of a tax evasion on the part of one Bitcoin user and two companies. There you go. And so for that, we can repudiate the entire Fourth Amendment. That is the state of where we are, the bipartisan state of where we are. It is a sorry state. Stay with us. We'll be right back with information about the Fukushima earthquake as it develops. But for you to say that you're comfortable with fake news getting posted, that that's okay. Sorry, when what you this know is that about, define fake what this me. is about, well, you can't define fake. That's yes, the problem. What this lies, is about is left-leaning mainstream media <laughs> blaming conservative media for losing the election, losing credibility, and losing readers. Their definition of fake news is anything that doesn't align with their leftist agenda. Freedom of speech is staring down the barrel of a gun loaded by a cancer of global interests that have laid claim to the last remaining fragments of the First Amendment of the United States of America. RT reports former Congressman Ron Paul revealed a list of fake news journalists he claims are responsible for bogus wars and lies about Hillary Clinton's chances of winning the election. Journalists from CNN, The New York Times, and The Guardian are included. According to the report on his website, Ron Paul Liberty Report, this list contains the culprits who told us that Iraq had weapons of of mass destruction and lied us into multiple bogus wars. Paul claims the list is sourced and holds a lot more water than a list previously released by Melissa Zimdars, who is described by Zero Hedge as an ultra-liberal assistant professor of communications at Merrimack College. Zimdars' list in itself should be considered fake. A list containing actual fake news sites alongside true news gathering alternative view sites that utilize a system of dissecting the mainstream narrative and its long history of fake reporting. Fake reporting is nothing new. Just ask Brian Williams. After a ground fire incident in the desert during the Iraq war invasion, I made a mistake in recalling the events of 12 years ago. It did not take long to hear from some brave men and women in the air crews who were also in that desert. I want to apologize. I said I was traveling in an aircraft that was hit by RPG fire. I was instead in a following aircraft. With the loss of the globalist foothold and the quiet death of the smith munn Act in 2013, propaganda is being waged on all fronts. George Orwell said, Threats to freedom of speech, writing, and action, though often trivial in isolation, are cumulative in their effect and unless checked, lead to a general disrespect for the rights of the citizen. Is the Constitution a living document? open to interpretation or is it something that must be read strictly and adhered to regardless of the day you know scott that is the question that is asked constantly of judges and so to talk about strict interpretation or living constitution those are not words i use 
And they're not words that I think have much meaning. The very concept of objective truth is fading out of the world. Lies will pass into history. George Orwell. You know, when we first got in there, started looking around and didn't find anything, as you get that kind of sinking feeling that, oh, and then time went on. And then we got tips, you know, there, I'll never forget the tip that there was crates buried, you know, hidden in the Euphrates River. They found, maybe these are them. And they've sent frogmen and there's nothing there. In our age, there is no such thing as keeping out of politics. All issues are political issues and politics itself is a mass of lies, evasions, folly, hatred and schizophrenia. George Orwell. You have to represent all of the people and the people have to believe that. You have to have the rule of law that applies to everyone, not just to some of the people. For those of you who are concerned about my using personal email, I understand. And I am sure they will reach the same conclusion they did when they looked at my emails for the last year. There is no case here. All the war propaganda, all the screaming and lies and hatred comes invariably from people who are not fighting. George Orwell. You're helping us to destroy ISIL, and we will destroy them. You're keeping us safe. The low-key announcement of additional troop deployments marked the 11th by the Obama administration in the last 27 months, each time ranging from 200 to 1,500, such that the total number of U.S. troops and advisors in Iraq will exceed 5,000 by the time the president leaves office. It is up to the individual, emboldened by the rights of a free press and the protection of the liberty passed down from the founders, to control their own mind and their own destiny. John Bound for Infowars.com. Welcome back to the Nightly News. Owen Schroyer alongside Margaret Howell and the parents of the deceased Seth Rich are looking for more answers, looking for new leads in his case. Now, it's strange to me, Margaret, that they are saying conspiracy theories swirling around their son's killing are lies. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that uh, they're very well-meaning people, and obviously their son was murdered. Um, and sometimes you say things that when you don't have all the facts, uh, your opinion changes as more information comes forward. And let's face it, they haven't had a lot of information in their son's death at all. And what's really heartbreaking, Owen, is that the mother of Seth Rich, uh, she had a press conference today, and we'll get into the specifics of that, but we brought you a clip. He knows nothing about us. He didn't know Seth, and he's a Republican. <laughs> and here he is stepping up to help my son, who is a Democrat. We were going around the neighborhood, putting these signs and posters up on posts and asking the business people, please, could we hang these? Because we need the public's help. We need everybody's help. I know, I know Seth knew the right thing. If everybody helps us, we will find these murderers. So your heart really breaks for his mother. Um, understandably, the dad was there too. And this lobbyist, Jack Berkman, he's a Republican. He put up $100,000 in addition to the award already. WikiLeaks had a portion of it, uh, but 100K coming from him. And look, you hear Mary Rich, you know, pleading anybody. She's going door to door uh, to the businesses in that area and handing out flyers, wanting anybody who's seen anything at all to come forward. What I find really remarkable here, all of those security cameras, I've mentioned this before on the show, I lived in the same area uh, within a few blocks of where this where this man was killed. And I find it very hard to believe that with all those security cameras, there wasn't a single image that captured uh, the two men that shot her son in the back four times. And they're calling it a robbery, a botched robbery. Yet the wallet and the keys and the cell phone are laying on the floor right next to him. Well, and that's an interesting point as you're talking about Mary Rich looking for answers here mm -hmm. and she's had so little. I mean, you know, there's so much mystery still uh, revolving around uh, the murder of Seth Rich. But to me, if I was looking for answers, I would do what you're alluding to. I would go and I would find those mm -hmm. cameras. Mm -hmm. I would go to the site. I would find those cameras. I would see who has that footage. And then, you know, I mean, look, who knows if we'll ever know who is leaking this stuff to Julian Assange? <laughs> who knows if we'll know if Seth Rich was involved was the week, the in, WikiLeaks. in WikiLeaks, right? right? So we'll never know that. But if I was Mary Rich, that's where I would be going for answers. Mm -hmm. I would be going to the people who have that footage. You've said it's a highly surveyed area. Mm -hmm. And I would be going to WikiLeaks or the Democratic Party and trying to figure out 
was there an involvement here? Did my son leak anything to Julian Assange that put his safety at risk? Especially since he's not the only one that died around that same time period with a similar uh, circumstance. No investigation, you know, cl case closed. I'm of course, I'm talking about the attorney that petitioned to have the records of the DNC. His name is escaping me at the moment, but very similar uh, circumstance. You know, he was found in his apartment by his girlfriend, young man, and working for the same people. The this is a bizarre uh, coincidence, to say the least. And, you know, this GOP lobbyist, Jack Berkman, wanting answers just like everybody else does. Your heart goes out to this family. But at the same time, it makes you wonder why Mary Rich is thanking Donna Brazil for helping her, you know, get answers. It's a very strange thing. It's like there's a veil of confusion on this family. It needs to be lifted. My heart goes out to them. You know, this is Thanksgiving week, the time you spend with your family. And this poor woman doesn't have her very young, talented son because, uh, you know, of whatever reason, Owen. And it's really strange. A second thing that's really strange to me, the DNC police chief, there was no investigation. It was open and shut. Botched robbery. That never happens. That That's highly unusual. This lady, her name is Kathy Lanyer, I believe, within a few weeks of this happening, she's quietly promoted to a cushy security job. It, nothing else said or done. It's a very mysterious Thing to have happened so shortly after a death, you think that such a high profile death, it would be your one and only priority to investigate it and make sure that you've uncovered every single stone related to why this young man died in the streets that night. Well, and I mean, botched robbery is not going to hold up um, in any line of questioning or in any court case. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so it was a botched robbery, I guess, because they didn't steal anything, but that doesn't explain why he was murdered. And they're trying to say that there was a struggle. Um, but they really don't have any proof of that. Thank you so much, Maggie. And um, we'll have more um, about Seth Rich at Infowars.com. I'm here at the Texas Capitol where earlier today there was an unveiling for the African-American Monument. Today we come together, all Texans, to proudly honor the African-Americans who helped to grow Texas from the bounty of our land, from the sweat of their toil, from the aspirations and passions of their dreams. The fact is that African Americans have shaped this land that we are on today since long before it was even named the state of Texas. I am not the mayor of the city of Houston, the fourth largest city, because I am so smart and because I am so gifted. I am the mayor of the city of Houston because those folk that are on that monument paid the price that enabled me to be where I am today. And I give credit to every single one named that's on that monument that says together we can get where we are. But the best for African Americans has yet to come. To God be the glory for the good he has done. As soon as the unveiling began, two tribes of un-American ideologies began shouting at one another. One, the local Austin Communist Party that doesn't represent any American values. And on the other side, White Lives Matter. A white nationalist group. The same moniker they would have us peg on Trump's top advisor, Stephen Bannon. One of the groups protesting over there is Red Guards of Austin. On their Facebook page, they made violent threats. So what are you guys trying to achieve here today? Me? Movement? Yeah. What do you mean, you guys? Uh, Red Guard Austin. I'm not in Red Guards Austin. You're not? No. You sure about that? Oh, my God. Look out, Mark. Wait a minute. You marching a Black Lives Matter thing with a hammer and sickle? Is that you? What are you talking are you, We're just asking. Are you here? Are you with InfoWars? Yeah. Yeah. You look just like a guy oh, from Red Guards Austin. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. InfoWars still always f you. F you. Is you. F you. Yeah, all right. F you. Okay. F you. Don't, f don't push me, man. I'm not push you. Why are you saying I pushed you? I'm just You're saying. Piece of you guys always make up. No, you always calm down. Make calm down. Calm yourself. down. Calm down. Yourself. I don't want to listen to your bullshit. Yeah. Go cry. Go cry in the Constitution. No. Kill 
Both of these tribes would have us believe that they are supporting some kind of American ideal, but in reality, they're tribes of rabid dogs with un-American ideologues fueling their hatred of each other, while the rest of America presses on through the fog of hatred, confusion, and stupidity. John Bound for Infowars.com. Yesterday, it is being called Bloody Sunday as four officers were shot across the United States of America. Now, this is something that we're continuing to see develop um, the anger between citizens and cops. And now it's resulting in the deaths of police officers. Again, it's being called Bloody Sunday. Four police officers shot across the nation. San Antonio police detective Benjamin Marconi was fatally shot while he was sitting in his patrol call, uh, car writing a ticket. He was a 20-year veteran of the force. Also, three, three other police officers were wounded and two suspects killed in shootings in St. Louis and Gladstone, Missouri, and Sanibel, Florida. McManus, who um, is the police chief in San Antonio, said that he feels the police were targeted and that the police uniform is the target now, that would incorporate a hate crime. And just like people beating people up for being a Trump supporter, if you're going after someone for being a police officer, that is a hate crime. Now, James Pasco, the executive director of the National Fraternal Order, Fraternal Order of Police, said four attacks on officers in one day is an another alarming sign of the times. In July, five officers were killed in Dallas and Baton Rouge two weeks after that Dallas attack. Three more officers were killed and three others wounded. Now, in St. Louis on Sunday, a 46-year-old police sergeant who was shot twice in the face Sunday evening was released from the hospital, according to Chief Sam Dotson. Dotson said the officer was sitting in his cruiser in traffic when he was shot by someone in a nearby car. The 19-year-old suspect was killed hours later in another shootout. So there's clearly a targeted attack uh, being done on police officers right now. In Florida, an officer was in his patrol car wrapping up a routine traffic stop at, at about 8 p.m. on Sunday when he was shot in a drive-by shooting. So you've basically just got random attacks on police officers, people engaging in gunfights with police officers. And when did this start? Was this going on 10 years ago in this country? Not really to the extent that we're seeing it now, uh, especially just random attacks on police officers. So I'm just curious, is this the legacy that Barack Obama is telling you about, his legacy? Is this the legacy of the mainstream media fomenting this violence against police officers by running with false narratives? I say yes. Now, in another breaking story, a arrest has been made in New York with a suspected terrorist, Mohammed Rafiq Naji, who had been driving for Uber in the state of New York has been arrested. He is 37, he is facing charges of providing materials that support terrorism. The 37 year old Brooklyn resident has been arrested for allegedly trying to fight for ISIS. According to the documents filed in court on Saturday, prosecutors say Mohammed Najee, a citizen of Yemen and a permanent resident of the US has been expressing support for ISIS on social media since 2014, shocking. Shocking how he can do that, but if you support Trump, if you support Trump on social media, you get censored. You support ISIS, you're good to go. Now, it's being alleged that he traveled to Turkey and Yemen in 2015. His lawyers are saying he had a reason to be there. He is being held right now. Najee is alleged to have shared his plans for a local attack in New York with a confidential informant, and he's saying that he was going to hold this uh, attack in Times Square in a similar fashion to what we saw in Nice, France. And Najee is alleged to, have, alleged to have said that they want an operation in Times Square. So basically, and of course there have actually been others arrested. Um, he's not the first. I don't know uh, what the exact number is. Actually, it may be in this story. Um, a half dozen others have been accused of supporting ISIS or attempting to join the group since 2015 and Najee is the latest and allegedly 
he wanted to carry out a Nice style attack in Times Square. Now, I've filed reports from Times Square, and I've asked people if they are worried about a terror attack. Um, it's about 50 50. But the interesting thing about this is think about everything we've had happen in New York this year. On the 3rd of July, a explosion, an explosive device blew off a kid's leg in Central Park. No follow-up reports on that. They just claim it was an abandoned firework. I'm calling BS. Then you had the dumpster bombing in Chelsea, New York. That man was later arrested in New Jersey with potential ties to radical Islam. And now you've got Naji who was just arrested, who traveled to the Middle East and wanted to carry out a Nice-style attack in Times Square where it would be possible for him to do that, and he was a Uber driver. And at 5.59 a.m. local time in Japan, a 7.3 magnitude earthquake hit just off the coast of Fukushima, very close to the earthquake in 2011 that caused the major tsunami that caused the total catastrophe at the power plant of TEPCO in Fukushima. Now, TEPCO has said today uh, so far with the earthquake and the ensuing tsunami that there have been no uh, major malfunctions or damages to report. We were doing a live broadcast of that today. It did not look like we were going to reach the catastrophic levels that we did in 2011. Thank God our thoughts and prayers are still with the people of Japan who endure another earthquake and tsunami today. Thanks to everybody who tuned in to the nightly news. Alex Jones will be live 11 a.m. Central tomorrow. Nightly news, 7 p.m. Central. I'm Owen Schroyer. Thanks for tuning in.